Well, good morning, Marshall Road. It is good to see you. You guys having a good week? Yeah. Yes. Any of you guys are new out there, welcome as well. I'm sure you got loved on and hugged and asked to fill out a Connect card. If you didn't, I would be shocked. Uh, but no, they're not trying to sign you up for anything. They truly just want to get to know you. We want to see about being part of the family. So they will stop harassing you as soon as service is over. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but it's good to see you. As the offering plates go past, just remember, again, we're still in that operation of service and giving to the Lord. And we give through songs, we give through our monies and back to God, and then we give as our listening to what he has for us as we dive into the word and just hear what he has to share with us. So with that, upcoming events that are taking place, you can pray for the kids' ministry. They are getting ready for their musical. Um, they are excited, a little antsy. Um, the adults I heard are having the most fun with it, though. Um, that'll be taking place on May 5th. Um, that Sunday, we'll be having that here. It'll be a great time for that, for you guys to come out and support them with that. Also on that day, we'll be supporting the student ministry as they have their Walking Tacos, a fundraiser for camp that they'll be going to this summer. So it'll be a great day to come hear about Jesus and eat tacos. I don't know what can be more better at church. I mean, you hit pretty much everything right there. With that, too, we just want to let you know, um, as we keep up with things and going on, you want to be in the know, we have the monthly newsletter. Also, if you get the Church Center app and you log into Marshall Road, you can see what's going on there and the website. We try to keep things up to date. We've been working on it. So take the opportunity time to get those things to stay in the loop. With that, I don't think I have anything else. So let's pray and get into the message. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you this morning. And truly, we lift this time up to you, Lord. As we draw near to what you would have for us, Father, we pray that you would just guide our hearts and our minds. We pray the Holy Spirit would do a work to help us to see the truths that you have for each and every one of us, Lord, as his presence is in our life, Lord. As we reflect and are grateful for the work of your Son and the cross of taking our place so that we could have life with you, Lord, truly, it's amazing. So this time as we go into your word and hear what you have to say, we pray that you would just help us to keep our focus. Help our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our minds to focus on what you would have for us to grow on, Lord. Lord, I pray that I would be a vessel to be used by you, that I would speak your words and your truth and not my own. And truly in this time, Lord, we would see just who you would have us to be as we look at, our, at your word. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Well, we're continuing in our series, Ephesians, Finding Who You Are in Christ, as a reminder, this letter was written by Paul to the Ephesian church, but it was kind of left open where it was a resource to be passed around to the local churches. And even for us today, isn't that kind of amazing the way that Paul and God orchestrated some notes just to hand off to one people, but it was really meant for a whole lot of people. And God is great in the way that he does that because Paul shares with the Ephesians and with us as we begin in it to understand just the struggle that's real. When we come to Christ, everyone thinks it's going to be a bed of roses. But as we get into it, what do we find out? It's not that easy. And sometimes what do we have a tendency to do? To run back to our old ways. Why? Because they're familiar and they're even comfortable to us. But the true matter is, and what Paul preached to the Ephesians and to us as we're seeing is truly to fight that struggle and to remain in Christ and what he has for us. So, if you missed last week, I'm going to encourage you to go check it out, only because as it's going to go through this series, we are going to build. And it's going to be nice to see how God does that, but truly as it flows, we'll flow through the letter and just hear what Paul has to say as he lays out for us who God is and who we are in Christ, and truly you get to see the implications of that in our lives. So today we're going to finish out chapter 1. I know it's taken three weeks, and the crazy part about the whole thing is we saw last week with verses 3 through 14, that was just one really long sentence, right? Well, guess what? Today we're going to look at verses 15 through 23, and it's another really long sentence, which gives people like me hope because Paul wrote in a way that is just amazing, but it makes me realize when I talk a really long sentence that I'm not really out of place because <laughs> Paul did it first, right? And truly, as we're going to go through this again, last week we looked about Paul was just truly boasting in Christ and who we are as his people in Christ. But this sentence changes. It's a sentence that's a prayer intended to bring enjoyment and blessing for those in their spiritual 
walk. The title of the message is Encouragement in Christ. And again, we're going to be in First or Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. As you make your way there, I have a question for you. Have you ever had one of those days, those weeks, those months, those years, where life is going, but then there's those problems that come in? Those hard times that seem to last longer than they should, and you're starting to wonder, God, just what's going on? What's taking place? And then you find a note that's been delivered to you in the mailbox or it's sitting on your desk. And the note says something like this. Hi, friend. You're like, oh, they called me friend. (laughs) Yes, I do have one. And then it carries on to say, I want to let you know that I'm proud of you. And you're like, really? What did I do? They continue and says, you're one of a kind. You're awesome and you're doing great. Really? Because it doesn't really feel that way. But you know what? I'm beginning to believe it. And then there's the line that says, I'm praying for you as you go through. And then it's weird because they now state just exactly what you're going through. And the amazing thing is, is like you've asked for prayer. You've been kind of vague. But you really haven't told all the details. But somehow they have been praying for just you in that situation that circumstance, that thing that's before you. And in all of that, they remind you at the end of the message to keep your eyes on God, loving Jesus and those around you. And it's that moment that gives you that burst of energy to keep moving forward. It's that encouragement you get in Christ. It gives you breath to go forward. Well, today we're going to look at Paul's words And just those types of words that he has for us in Ephesians. So picking up in verse 15, we read, Therefore I, being Paul, also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of your Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of him. In the eyes... 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places." far above all principalities and powers in this age, but also in that which is to come. And it says in verse 22, he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen. Well, we're going to stop right there. And I find it interesting in Paul's letter, the way that he writes, have you ever had a conversation with someone that do- drops deep theological truth on you? And you're like, wow, thank you for that. I don't know how to process it right this moment. And as soon as you get to the point where you're starting to process it, they have another word to say, and you're like, oh, maybe they're going to explain it to me. But instead, they go ahead and drop even more theological truth on you, and you're just like, oh, it's one of those conversations. Okay, I'm not ready for this. Paul has a way of giving us God's truth, and he drops a deep theological truth in the verses that we saw last week. But in this week, he doesn't follow it up with more deep theological truth to get us going, okay. He in turn instead prays for us, and he offers this prayer that truly is one to encourage, a prayer to remind just what he's spoken, but to give us the hope that we need to carry on. He doesn't just drop the truth and go, here's more truth, now figure it all out, have a nice day, I'll see you next time. No, he gives us the truth, but then he says, I'm praying for you. Because he understands the struggle is real, the things that we're going through are there, unfortunately, we have to fight the urge to go back. And so he knows, guess what? They need to know how to go forward, just like the note that you could get from your friend that encouraged you to take that next step. And Paul's prayer here is to the Ephesians and to the believers is they would look at their inheritance in Christ as a whole. Because unfortunately, we have a tendency to break things up just when we need it. 
And that's not what Paul says here. We're not to divide what Christ has for us, what God has for us, but we're to see the fullness of the ministry of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in our lives. So let's just look at what Paul shares with us here in this passage this morning. And the first thing that we see is praying for God's work, which if you didn't know, Paul was writing this letter to the church in Ephesus and to us and to those that would hear it. This is an opening thing. And typically when Paul wrote a letter, he wrote a letter because there was a problem that needed to be fixed. So correction needed to take the course. Oftentimes, as we've seen, he's also written to churches um, that he hadn't been to, but he wanted to encourage them in fixing situations too. Understand this, Ephesians, the letter, is not a letter of correction. It's truly a letter of um, encouragement and to push forward in what they would have for us. But like any church, understand this, churches have problems. So this letter to the Ephesians right now is a good letter. It's a letter to encourage, to build them up, to take them on the next step. They did receive a letter, though, that wasn't so good. It's found in Revelation, and it had come from Paul. Guess who it came from? Jesus. And Jesus tells them this in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. He says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. And verse 5 says, next, Remember how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. So the Ephesians letter is a letter where Paul is encouraging, is exhorting, but the church in Ephesus did receive a letter that was one of correction. And the correction was as a result of them falling away from what it says there, their first love. And as I look at this prayer that here is truly Paul is mentioning their first love, their faith in the Lord and the love they had for all the saints. You see, the Ephesians had a love in their hearts. And though through the work of God and the Holy Spirit, they put that love into action as they cared for all the saints, the people that came to them, those that were there, they were probably more than likely the misfit set of church. When you look at them, you kind of wondered, is that a church group or a motley crew? I'm not too sure, but they're seeming to get along. They like each other. They love each other even. Actually, they're strange, but they have something that's drawing in, and they're caring for the people there because as they moved forward in their actions for one another, the results was evidence of their participation in the great work of God, which we have to understand when it comes to faith and love, these do not earn us participation points in God's great works, they are the evidence of our participation in God's plan. So if we're doing what God calls us to do, we're doing that faith and love. We're living it out with all the saints, which is crazy because how often do we get along with just our family, let alone a room full of people? But they are doing it. They are making a way here. And with that, Paul gives thanks for them, and not in their love for God, but their love for all the saints, the ministry that they are being a part of. I hope you understand and realize the evidence of God's work in us is not the love we claim. Just because we claim to love God doesn't say and show that we actually love God. How do we show that love? We show that love by loving others that we're commanded to do. John said it clearly in 1 John 4, 20 about this type of love. He says, if anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For a person who does not know his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So guess what? The greatest evidence of our love for God is how we love each and every person. And that's not just the folks that are here in the room with us, just so you know. It's not just the people you see in your household, but it's all the saints. So even the ones that cut you off on the freeway, the ones that take too long at the self-checkout line because they have 30 items instead of 15 items, we are to love them all. And Paul goes on to give thanks for God's work among the Ephesians. He also prayed that it would continue with greater strength. So at first, it could be easy to love people, right? And we can do it. But what happens when they're kind of resistant to that love? Then the challenge comes, right? Because then we make a choice. Oh, I'm going to love them until they love me back, right? <laughs> Which we know is not the right type of love. That's just us looking boastful on ourselves. 
Or as we step back and go, you know, I need to learn to love them like God. So what does that mean for me? How do I love them like God? So we're going to pause for a minute and reflect on what we've been doing. And we call these our so what moments. In our so what moments, we ask questions. And the question that we have for us on an easy one of how we can love others is, am I praying for others? Oftentimes, we say we're praying for people, right? But sometimes those prayers are simply, oh, please be with them. And we walk away. Sometimes they walk up to us and they talk with us and everything's good. And they're like, so can you pray for me? And we're like, yeah, have a nice day. We say we pray for people, but do we truly pray for one another? And sometimes we don't pray because we think prayer is complicated. I'm going to let you know on a secret, prayer is simple. All it is is a conversation with you and God. The best part is, is you get to just talk. And guess what he does? Listens. And sometimes I'm sure he sits up there and he shakes his head. And he sits there and he wants to sigh because we're just like, blah. But it's just simply a conversation. The hard part is listening for what he wants to tell you. And that comes with time as we pull into it. But one of the coolest things that we can do, as Paul Shores, is we can pray for others. And then not just pray for them, but praise God for the work he's doing in their lives. You ever pause for a moment and sit there and been praying for someone and then realize, you know, God, I'm really glad that you're doing a good work in them. It's amazing to see how far they've come along. Also, it makes it harder to be honoring with them, right? And to be a little upset with them because we're praying for what God is doing in their lives. Paul prayed for this simple prayer like this for the believers, um, not for the believers, for Israel. In Romans 10, 1, it says this, Paul said, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Right there, how much is a simple prayer for that for someone that you know that's not saved? God, I just pray they be saved. What is that doing? That's praying for God's work to take place in that person's life. Because guess what? When that person gets saved, and hopefully it's because you've been showing the love of God to them, guess who gets the glory? God. Yes. And that is one of probably the most amazing things. Paul also encouraged Timothy in 1 Timothy, and he said, pray, all, pray petitions of prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made to all people. That's one of the other great things as brothers and sisters. We can pray for our brothers and sisters. And sometimes we don't need to know the situation. Sometimes God gives us the words in the prayer that is the situation, which amazes us. Because sometimes we're like, why am I praying for them? I have no clue why Johnny needs my prayers right now, but I'm praying for Johnny. And you pray for him. And the cool thing is, is when you get to talk to him, and you have a conversation, you say something like, hey, I've been praying for you for this, this, and this, and they just stare at you kind of weirdly. Like, who told you that? Um, did you read my journal again? I don't journal. I mean, did you read my inner thoughts again? No, it's God doing that work for us. And think about it. Each time a person requests our prayers or not, when we pray for them, know this. God is already at work in their lives and your lives. And in praying for them, we are joining God's team in a sense, in essence of saying that we're looking out for all the saints. We're praying for them and what God has to do in their lives. And when we pray for them, we're praying for change. We're praying for healing, reconciliation, renewal, and transformation in a person's life that we probably know nothing about. But the good thing is we're praying for God to do that work, not ourselves. Praying for one another is a gift that God gives on our benefit, to strengthen our faith. Did you know that? Because it's a kind of an amazing thing. Have you ever sit there at a time and praying for someone? And been praying for them, and then you have a conversation, and, and you talk to them, and they, had, they didn't tell you what's going on, but you're telling them how you're praying for them, and they're sitting there telling you all the good things that God's been doing? And then you get to do what? You both get to praise God. But it strengthens you to remember, wow, prayer does do an amazing thing. So often I cut it short and like, okay, yeah, I'm supposed to pray for them. And I went through the steps. But the reality of the matter is, is it strengthens our faith. And when we do this, we pray on behalf of someone else. Sometimes we don't know what to say. And know that that's okay. Because as Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 33, 3, he says this when he's working with the folks. He says, call to me, as to God, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. See, when we call to God, God, I want to pray for Stevie. I don't know what to pray, but I know I got to pray for him. God's going to put the words into your mind. He's going to give you the things to think about and to work through, and you'll get to see those things come to truth. So we've seen that we are to pray for God. 
So now we need some practical steps on how to pray, right? So now what we're going to look at is Paul's prayer list that he gives us here in this passage. And his prayer list is broken up into a couple different parts. And the first part we see is he prays for greater wisdom. Paul prays that the Ephesian believers and for us would develop a deeper knowledge of Christ because knowing Christ in the New Testament shows our or describes our faith. Truly, Jesus said this about our faith and knowing him in John chapter 17, verse 3, when he says, And this eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom we have sent. We need to know God in order to understand God. And as we grow in our understanding and knowledge of him, it's because we grow deeper in looking for him and who he is. It doesn't mean that we just start and know the facts, because have you ever said that you knew somebody? It's really easy to go, hey, I know that guy, as they walk by. And the crazy thing is, is you may have never had a conversation with them. The closest thing that you've ever done to them is said hi or hello. But when you see something happen and someone else is there, you can sit there and go, I know him. And I'm not talking like Buddy Elf kind of way if I knew him. It's just a simply fact that, yeah, I know him. But what does it mean to truly know Christ and to know God? It's that deeper knowledge. It's more than simply just a handshake. Because understand this, the demons know Jesus. And to be honest with you, that should scare us. Because they know Christ. Jesus even said this, those that claim and would say they knew me, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 through 23, he says this, many of you will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done wonders in your name? And he carries on to say in the next verse, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So to simply say you knew Christ without knowing him, having that head, that heart connection, it's going to show evidence one day. Sure, you may be able to fool the people now, but when the day comes and we stand before, he will surely let us know those that truly knew him. Paul encourages says, if anyone loves God, this is known by him. God knows those who love him. And it shows again in what we're doing. So Paul wants the beloved Ephesians, he wants us as believers to have a full faith and to love, to go deeper than just simply a knowledge of Christ. Our knowledge, though, comes from the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit knows God and truly is the one who helps us understand who God is. He intercedes in our life. As Paul wrote, the Holy Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. No one comprehends the thoughts of God, except the Holy Spirit, and then he reveals those to us in our life. It's amazing because sometimes we sit there and ponder and want to know about God, right? We have those questions. Where do we go to? The internet? No, you don't go to the internet. You go to the Bible, right? Because this has got everything to know about God. And you get to start reading it, and there's passages that sometimes when you read it, you're like, that makes no sense to me. And then a few weeks later, you pick it up and you read it again, you're like, Oh, that's what you meant, God. That's amazing. Who do you think did that? The Holy Spirit. Doing his part for us. And the only way to truly do that is to ask God for that help. And he'll give us that help or the Holy Spirit from it. So from here we see that we prayed for wisdom. The next thing that Paul prays for is for a greater vision. I know what you're thinking. An eye exam in the middle of a prayer. How does that work out? Well, not quite those eyes, but truly what he's praying for is for greater spiritual vision. Um, He prays that we would have eyes of their hearts enlightened. In scripture, the heart is the understanding, which can be defined as the center of one's personality. Our heart shows who we are to those that we live and do life with. And Paul prays, therefore, that the spiritual center our hearts, would be given spiritual eyes because without the Holy Spirit's help, we suffer from this problem called nearsightedness because we don't fully see what God has for us. We're caught up in our own personal moments as opposed to seeing the big picture. Specifically, Paul asked that we would have our vision bettered regarding three things. 
hope, riches, and power. Observe the words of Paul's prayers again in verse 18. We read, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is exceedingly greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. So the first thing that we see here is hope. Paul wants us to have better vision. He wants us to understand the hope of his calling. Hope is the source of our election, which we looked at last week, that took place before the creation of the world. And it's sealed in us by the Holy Spirit, giving us truly the ability to see to what is to come. Hope is the grand marvel of things. It's manifested in Christ's joy as we read in Romans, and as heirs of him, Christ's children. Remember, we're adopted into the family. We indeed suffer with Christ, but at the same point in time, we also will be glorified together with Christ. And when Christ appears, then also appears him in his glory, and we will be beside him when he comes again. Paul prays that we would understand and grasp the whole gigantic truth of hope. And not just put our hopes in the wrong things. Oftentimes we do that, right? We sit there and put our hopes into simple things. Like, I really hope for a better year. I really hope that I get it right this time. I really hope I do good. But we miss out so often because we put our hope into simple things. Now understand this. As we've seen and you can see as you read through scriptures, not everybody's life's perfect. Right? And when we come to Christ, our life is not made perfect. We're going to have our hills and our valleys. And there's going to be times where we're going to go through things that are bad. And there's nothing wrong with expressing sadness or despair. The problem is, is do we get stuck in those things? Because understand this, as a believer, our hope is in greater things. Our hope is not lost simply in the sense of hope, but our hope is in Christ. And when we look to Christ, we know that truly He gives us the hope that surpasses all understanding. He gives us the comfort in order to go through things that are unexplainable to most people. And with him, we have a greater hope. You see, hope for the believer is the opposite of despair for the world. It breathes optimism because we know the end. Remember the end? Who wins? God wins. So should that not encourage us? to go forward because why? The hope has been revealed to us. John said this about the hope. He said, beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. When Christ comes again, we get to see Christ for who he is. And the greatest thing is we are his children. We are his heirs. So what do we get? all those benefits and rewards because of the hope we have in him. So from hope, he goes to riches. And Paul prays that our eyes would be open to the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. This was interesting here because often as we read this, we think it's about us, but not the case. His inheritance here that Paul is writing about is truly about God's inheritance. And guess who his inheritance is? Us each and every one of us, his heirs. And truly, it's an understanding that we are so precious that God would consider us his heirs. I don't know about you, but in the grand scheme of things, God who created everything and owns everything, you and I and each and all, yet he describes us as his inheritance. That is an amazing feat in and of itself because we're worth more than the universe. And we ought to be delirious with this truth, this Paul praise that we would see this with our heart's eyes, that we're simply not just an individual. We are God's chosen ones. So from hope to riches to power, Paul prays that those who believe to know God in such an extent that they can utilize the very power, it says there, that raised Jesus from the dead. I don't know about you, but that is some amazing power. In the Greek, it's called dynamus, where we get our word dynamite. And we all know what dynamite is, right? It's explosive. 
That is power because it moves things. We should be that type of power, and we have that type of power. And the way that Paul describes it here is that power raised Jesus from the dead. I don't know about you, but I've never met a person that brought anybody back to life. Now, as humans, we have the ability if a person's heart stops, we can perform CPR, right, and bring them back. We have the technology and machinery that can bring them back to life, but God can bring a person back after three days. That is the power that he's talking about here. That is the power that we have. And truly in this passage, as crazy as it is, looking to it, commentators were trying to understand it, the debate that goes back and forth when Paul writes here that far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also the age to come, was referring to the levels of the things that are taking place, things that we don't all understand. We understand this level, but what about the spiritual realm of things? We don't understand all of that, the things that work, and there's things that take place in there, like the angels and the demons. But when describing this passage, what Paul is saying here is Jesus has the power over it all. All will be set to his, under his foot. He will have authority. Jesus is complete authority of all believers. Each of us who believes in Jesus Christ is part of the church, as it says, the body, and we, guess what, get that power. Remember, Jesus is the head, and we are participants in God's grand plan by fulfilling the role he's designated for each and every one of us. And here's the hard part sometimes. Have you ever watched someone in the faith going through a different place and go, man, why do they get more time than me? How come they get to do this and I don't? My voice is just as good as theirs. Why can't I be up there? Or one of mine is, well, why does that person get to preach again? What makes them so special? And we start to do what? Compare. And when we compare, what do we do? We belittle little things, and we sit there and we wonder. And we have to understand, though, God gives to each and every one of us. The thing is, are we leaning into the hope and the riches and the power that he has for us? Or are we stepping back and simply just saying, well, I could, but I'm not right now. Because what he's looking for is us to step forward in just what we have, which is why Paul prayed that we would have greater wisdom and greater vision to be able to go forward in what God has called us to do. So what? We pause again and reflect through this. And the so what question is this one. Are you moving forward in your identity in Christ? There's two directions a person can travel, right? Forwards or backwards. But nine times out of 10, we never say we're going backwards. What do we say we are? Stuck. Just know if you're stuck, that means you're not moving. That's even worse than moving backwards. But the crazy thing is if you're stuck and not moving and other people are moving forward, you're still moving backwards. It's a choice you have to make to move. Do you choose to move forward or do you choose to not move at all? And God calls us to undertake his task. And he has roles for each and every one of our lives. And when we step forward in those roles, we're moving and growing more in who he would, has created us to be. When we stop, he doesn't stop. Guess what? He keeps working. Then we have to get caught up again. And that's a fun process because it's never like we think, well, all I did was get off the track. That means I should be able to get back on the track. Have you seen when a treadmill is going, when someone tries to get back on it, what happens? <laughs> Whew, man, all I think is, ouch. Because you step on and what goes? Boom. I thought about falling, but I decided I couldn't get up. <laughs> so know this. If you're not moving forward, you're not moving at all. So we have to be careful. So how do we keep moving forward? How do we rest in his power? How do we find our identity in him to move forward? Well, I want to give us three ways to remember your identity in Christ that are taken from the passage that we looked at today. And the first one is this. Be wise about what and who you are listening to. Just because the TV's on doesn't need to mean you need to watch that program. Just because the radio station is on a certain station doesn't mean you need to listen to the person that's on it. And just because the magazine is free in the rating room does not mean you need to read it. Sadly enough, with the way things are, voices are out there. But the problem is, are those voices leading you down the right path? In Paul's letter to the Romans, he says this in Romans 12 too. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So often, because the resources are out there, there's many voices out there. But the problem with those many voices is, we don't know truly about them. They may sound flashy, they may sound inviting, and we get hooked into it only to find out that it's wrong. But the problem is, is we've listened too long to that voice instead of sitting there and listening to the voice that matters. As we read his word and understand it, the Holy Spirit gives us, in essence, the wisdom, the understanding to know just what is right. We have to be careful of the information that we're consuming. And the best way to consume the right information is to read God's word daily, but also use it as the funnel. And I don't mean pour it all into it and see what, or use this here, okay, whatever, but use it as a funnel in a way where everything goes through it into us. We hear, we seek the truth. We find the answers. Does it match up or does it not match up? What does God have for us? Or as Paul prayed, let us have greater wisdom. The second aspect that we can look at here is believe what God says about you. We talked about it before in this series and looking at it. As Christians, we tend to, we tend to forget who we are in Christ. We're good for a bit, and then all of a sudden we sit there and go, oh yeah, who am I again? It's like we have this weird amnesia. And the world is always coming at us, telling us who we are. We have to be careful what, again, we listen to. And one of the things we do is we accept the information that we know to be true. We trust God when he says these things about us, especially when it comes to our identity. First, that we're made in God's image. As it states in Genesis, who are we created in? His image. Second, you are custom designed and one of a kind. As the psalmist wrote, God put you together in your mother's womb. He knows you. There's a reason you are the way you are. And when you embrace it, oh my gosh, it's so amazing to see what God does with you. Because it's great to pretend to be someone else, but when you're not someone else trying to do their thing, it's hard. But when you're who God's designed you to be, it's an amazing thing. And then lastly, the one that the world throws at us so much and where people struggle so much is the fact of this, you are unconditionally loved. As, God, as Paul stated in Romans, and we understand that God loved us so much. Even reflecting on this, that he sent his only begotten son, that you could have everlasting life with the Father. You are loved. And we hold these to be truth. It's the reminder and the words that sink in that your physically, mentally, spiritual self is a grand work of a unique God who truly loves you. Or as Paul prayed, that we would have greater vision. Which brings to the last of the three in keeping forward with our identity in Christ. Keep moving forward. One self-worth is based in ourselves, but our, not in ourselves, but in our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we talked a few minutes ago in understanding truly we have to move forward in Christ. Because when we stop, we're not moving. And when we try to hop back into it, what do we end up on? Our faces. Which means we have to get what? Picked up again. And if we're not too smart, what do we end up again on? Our faces. Which then we just create a cycle. But when we stop and see what God has for us and allow God to move us, we move forward in what he has. And you can press on, not because of your power or your worth, but because of the power and worth that we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus showed us how valuable he considers us. He died for us on the cross. He took our sins so that we could have life with the Father eternal. And then he showed us just how much he loves us by wanting to have a relationship with us. The Father loves us so much much. Or as Paul prayed, let us have greater power. Oftentimes our eyes get convoluted in what we can see and we can, can't see. And the great thing is when we can pray for others, we can help to open their eyes. Which reminded me of an instance over in 2 Kings with Elisha and his servant. And Elisha was going through some different things and the enemy was coming at him, but the servant couldn't see the good. The only thing the servant could see, well, let's read it. In 2 Kings verse 6, picking up in verse 15, it says, And when the servant of the man of God arose early, he went out, and there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariot. 
And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? In verse 16, it says, And so he answered, this being the master, Do not fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And it says in verse 17, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then, it says, the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariot of fire all around Elisha. Sometimes we have to be reminded, and people have to pray that our eyes would be open so that we could see that God has already won the victory. Amen? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you right now, Lord. And as we come into this time of response, Lord, I pray that you be with each and every one of my brothers and sisters. I pray that you be with me. As we can see the encouragement that Paul has given us, the words to understand and to grow just in who you would have us to be in Christ. So, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. As they go through their things this week, as they go through their problems, I pray that you would give them the wisdom. I pray that you give them the vision and the power to handle those things as they look to you, their Father. Lord, and truly in all of it, I pray that the glory would go to you. So as we come to this time again, Lord, and pray, just be with us and be in our hearts as we respond to your message. In Jesus' name, amen.